All right, good afternoon. Welcome to our policy plenary session. It is my tremendous honor and pleasure to introduce Tracy Smith as the Jarvik Russell Award winner and her talk this afternoon. Um, so when, as part of the program committee for SRNT, you learn a lot of things about the way the conference is structured and also the lore that goes along with it. And so the Jarvik Award, Jarvik Russell Award winner is always introduced by a previous award winner, which I didn't know. So I reached out for some help um, and got another previous award winner to provide some comments in addition to mine. Hi hey everyone. Like so many, I'm sorry to miss SRNT this year. It was a particularly hard decision because I'm so proud that Tracy's receiving the SRNT Jarvik Russell Early Career Award. As many of you already know, Tracy is an outstanding researcher. I was lucky enough to recruit her to Pitt for graduate school where she led some of the first preclinical studies in tobacco regulatory science before transitioning to my human lab where she played a critical role in the scenic trials on reduced nicotine cigarettes. During her time at Pitt, she was remarkably productive, but more importantly, she rapidly became an independent scholar who pushed our thinking and was never afraid to explore new ideas, areas, or techniques. It was not long before I realized that I didn't ha really have a student on my hands, but rather a collaborator who just happened to not quite have her degree yet. On behalf of Alan, Rachel, Laura, Sarah, Sam, Melissa, and everyone at Pitt, and Dorothy, Joe, Andrew, Neil, Jen, Lauren, Rachel, and all the rest of your CNIC colleagues, I want to send our most heartfelt <laughs> salute. There is no one more deserving of the award, and certainly no one more willing to do whatever it takes for science, including leaving poor Frank to fend for himself while you collected gallons of urine at a two-star hotel for a week. <laughs> and as if that wasn't enough, you went back for more, as I suspect everyone might hear about today. <laughs> all joking aside, we all feel very lucky to have you as a colleague, and I know Matt, Ben, Mike, and all the folks at MUSC feel the same way. You represent the very best of SRNT, passionate, dedicated, and yet humble. I wish I was there to share this moment with you and celebrate your achievements. But congratulations. And Andrea, if you can FaceTime me, I would love to watch. Everybody take care. Please join me in welcoming Tracy Smith. Thank you guys so much, and thanks from afar to Eric. Um, okay, so I appreciate everyone being here today, especially given the risks and the travel difficulties associated with coming. So when I think about regulating tobacco products, one of the, the ways that I think about how we should do that is by thinking about the, the um, imbalance and the relative reinforcement of combusted tobacco products and non-combusted tobacco products. So everybody knows that combusted tobacco products like cigarettes are the most harmful tobacco products available. They're also unfortunately the most relatively reinforcing tobacco products. And so I think one of the goals of tobacco product regulation should be to target that reinforcement and make those products less reinforcing and less addictive. One of the ways that we can do that is by thinking about the reason that people smoke cigarettes and why they're so addictive and so reinforcing. And people smoke to obtain nicotine, which everyone in here knows. So one of the things that we could do is we could reduce the level of nicotine in cigarettes to a very low level so that those cigarettes are minimally addictive or non-addictive. And this is not a new idea, it's been around for decades, but it is new that the FDA is considering doing that. So in 2009, Obama signed the Tobacco Control Act, which gave the FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products for the first time. And they can do that if it's appropriate for the protection of public health by setting product standards. So they can require that cigarettes across the board have a nicotine level that is reduced to a minimally addictive or a non-addictive policy. So to be clear, I'm talking about like a mandated policy across the board, all cigarettes would have a very low level of nicotine in them. And in 2017, the then FDA commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, announced that that was something that the FDA was formally considering doing. So a lot of my research has focused on this research question, how would a mandated reduction in the nicotine content of cigarettes affect smoking behavior? 
And I've done that with a lot of different methodologies, as Eric alluded to, so I will uh, introduce those so that um, you know what I'm talking about as I go through them. So that's included clinical trials where we give people research cigarettes that have different levels of nicotine in them, and we ask people to exclusively use the research cigarettes that we provide to them in order to model an FDA policy. Um, human laboratory assessments where we can ask about one specific aspect of a nicotine reduction policy or one specific dimension. And then rodent self-administration experiments um, where we can answer questions that might be difficult or impossible to address in human smokers. So as an example of what the data on clinical trials related to nicotine reduction show, um, these are data that I collected with Eric at Pitt and as part of Scenic. Um, and what's plotted here is the change in cigarettes per day for the control group. And we asked the control group to exclusively smoke research cigarettes that had a normal nicotine content in them for a six-week period. These are double-blind studies, so they don't know what they get, we don't know what they get. And what you can see is that the control group smokes more cigarettes per day across the six-week period. We call that the free cigarette effect. When you give people cigarettes for free, they smoke more of them. You can compare that to a group that is given research cigarettes that have a very low level of nicotine in them for a six-week period, and we track their smoking over that time period. And what you see is that the, the, the group that gets the low nicotine cigarette smokes about four or five cigarettes per day fewer than the control group, and this is true across a lot of other clinical trials as well. The downside to these clinical trials is that, again, the cigarettes are provided for free, so we don't know what would happen if people were paying for their cigarettes. And we're trying to model a regulatory situation in which all cigarettes have low nicotine in them. People can't go to the store and just buy their normal nicotine content cigarettes. And so in the clinical trial, we ask people, hey, here's some research cigarettes. There's plenty of them. Please only smoke these that we're giving you. Don't smoke anything else. But we know that people cheat, and they smoke their own cigarettes. So it's hard to know what would happen in the context where people have to be completely compliant. We can address these limitations using some of those other methodologies. So for uh, the limitation regarding the price of cigarettes and what would happen if people were paying, we can use tasks like the cigarette purchase task. So for people that aren't familiar, the cigarette purchase task here was embedded in one of these clinical trials where after six weeks of smoking research cigarettes, we say to people, hey, those research cigarettes that you've been smoking for the last six weeks, I want you to imagine a situation in which that's all you have access to. How many of those cigarettes would you smoke if they were a penny? How many if they were five pennies or 50 cents, a dollar, five dollars? And we can ask about the impact of low nicotine cigarette smoking across a variety of prices. So these are hypothetical data from a clinical trial where people had six weeks of experience with the research cigarettes. These are the control groups, so the usual brand control group and the normal nicotine content control group. And you can see that as the price of cigarette goes up, people say that they would smoke fewer of those cigarettes. You can compare that to research cigarettes that have a variety of other nicotine contents. And so what you see there is that when the nicotine content is decreased and when it gets below 2.4 milligrams of nicotine per gram tobacco or less, people report that they would smoke fewer cigarettes per day across a variety of prices, consistent with the data from the clinical trials. We can also ask about, would you even continue to buy these cigarettes? So as part of that same clinical trial, after six weeks of exposure, when people are still blind to their nicotine content, we asked, one year from now, if the only cigarette available for purchase was the study cigarette, how much would you be smoking? And the choices were, I would be smoking more, I would be smoking the same, I would be smoking less, or I would stop smoking. And what's plotted here is the percentage of people in each of those groups who said, I would stop smoking one year from now if this is all I had as a choice. And what you see is in the lower nicotine content group, that's nicotine content on the x-axis, more people report that they would stop smoking. And in the lowest nicotine content group, it's actually 50% of people that say, if this is the only cigarette that I had available to me in the long term, I wouldn't even smoke anymore. To answer the question, the limitation regarding compliance, we can use rodent self-administration models. So to be clear, this is, these are experiments where rats have the opportunity to press a lever, like shown here in the picture, or they poke their nose in a hole, and they earn an IV infusion of nicotine. And then we can change the dose of nicotine or reduce it and ask how that changes responding for nicotine. And this addresses that concern about, about compliance because the rats can't cheat and go to the store and buy their own cigarettes. So these are some data from those types of studies. What's plotted here is the number of infusions earned by a group of rats who were responding for a relatively high dose of nicotine across a series of daily sessions. 
So you can think about this as like cigarettes per day in human smokers. And then we reduce the dose of nicotines that the rats receive. And what you see is the same pattern that I've shown you from the humans. Rats that receive a reduction in nicotine dose to a relatively high dose of nicotine continue to respond for that nicotine, similar to the control group. Rats that receive a reduction to a lower dose of nicotine, in this case 3.75 micrograms of nicotine per kilogram, they respond at a much lower rate, similar to saline substitution. So what you're seeing across the board, across these different methodologies, is a, the same pattern, and that is that a reduction in nicotine content is likely to, re to result in a reduction in smoking rate, and in the case of those cigarette purchase test data I show you, we think that they're also likely to increase smoking cessation. And there are other um, data from other investigators that are consistent with that interpretation as well. Okay, so one of the concerns and criticisms that we get a lot about nicotine reduction is the impact of nicotine reduction on smoking initiation. And this is really important, right? So I've shown you data that imply that current smokers would smoke less, but what about people who don't smoke yet? If they smoke those low nicotine cigarettes, are they gonna become addicted? And this is a difficult question for us to answer in humans because we can't ask kids to please start smoking the low nicotine cigarettes to see what would happen. But we can address this question using our rodent self-administration paradigm. So we can take a group of rats that are responding for a relatively high dose of nicotine and then reduce that dose of nicotine, in this case, to one of three lower doses or saline. And what's plotted here is the number of infusions, um, the last three, an average of the last three infusions. And what you see is the same pattern that I showed you before. Rats that experience a reduction to 7.5 or higher continue to respond. Rats that re receive a reduction to 3.75 or lower, they respond less. And then we can compare that to a group of rats that don't have a history with that higher dose of nicotine. We give them the opportunity to respond for those lower doses of nicotine for the very first time. So you can think about this as analogous to humans who have the opportunity to self-administer low-dose nicotine cigarettes for the first time. And what you see is that the rats who don't have a history with that higher dose of nicotine, they respond at a similar rate or even a lower rate as rats that do have a history with the higher dose of nicotine. So these data are encouraging because they suggest that individuals who start smoking following a nicotine reduction policy are likely to smoke at a similar rate or even a lower rate as current smokers who do have a history with the typical cigarettes that are on the market today. Okay. One of the other common concerns and criticisms regarding a nicotine reduction policy surrounds compensation. And I think this is a really important one for us to talk about. It's the idea that, well, if you reduce how much nicotine is in a cigarette, won't people just smoke more? And there are a couple of ways that that could happen. So one is that if you reduce how much nicotine is in a cigarette, people could smoke way more cigarettes per day. They could smoke two, three, four, 20 times the number of cigarettes that they smoke now. The other way that it could happen is people could change how they smoke those cigarettes to smoke them more intensely to obtain more nicotine. So they could take more puffs or they could take larger puffs to obtain more nicotine. We've tried to address this in a lot of different ways because I think it's an important question. So I've already shown you data from clinical trials that are consistent with lots of other clinical trials that show that across a period of several weeks, people who smoke low nicotine cigarettes don't smoke more, they smoke fewer cigarettes per day. And that's the case here as well as in other trials. We've also tried to answer that question about puff topography using laboratory measures like what's shown here. These are data from Eric Donnie's clinical trial, where at the end of a six-week period, participants who have been assigned to research cigarettes with lower nicotine come in, they smoke a single cigarette in a lab through a device that measures how they smoke it, and then we plot puff volume, a measure of how much smoke people were exposed to from that cigarette. And in that case, what you see is people in the lowest nicotine content actually have lower puff volume than individuals in the normal nicotine content, which is relatively encouraging. The downside to these data are that they're relatively artificial also, right? People are coming into the lab, sit in a laboratory setting, smoking a single cigarette through a machine, which is not how they smoke in the real world. In order to address that question, one of the things that we did in this clinical trial is we asked people to hang on to the cigarette butts that they smoked as part of that clinical trial. So the day prior to their week six visit, they collected up to 20 cigarette butts that they were smoking out in the real world as they normally would and bring them into the lab with them. We took those cigarette butts, we sent them to the Centers for Disease Control who analyzed the cigarette butts for what's called Solanosol. And using Solanosol, they are able to take that cigarette butt and estimate how much nicotine the participant was exposed to from the cigarette. So this is a really cool analysis because it's not something that in, is invasive at all to the participants. They're smoking as they normally would, they're hanging onto the cigarette butts, and then we can tell something about how they smoked that cigarette from the cigarette butt. 
And so what's plotted here is the estimated nicotine yield for each of the different research cigarettes. And what you see is in the lower nicotine contents, people are exposed to less nicotine. That shouldn't be a surprise. There's less nicotine in the cigarette. We can take those data and create what's called a compensation index. And for those that aren't familiar, a compensation index is a measure of the proportion of nicotine that is recovered or recuperated by changes in smoking behavior. So anything above zero is gonna indicate that participants are recuperating some of the nicotine that was lost by increasing their smoking intensity. And so these are those data. And what you see across the reduced nicotine research cigarettes, these are 95% confidence intervals, is that the 95% confidence will always include zero. So there isn't any evidence from these data that the participants are increasing their smoking intensity of these research cigarettes. Okay, one of the downsides to all the clinical trials that I've already told you about is that the participants are cheating. We are trying to model a situation in which people can't go to the store and buy normal nicotine content Marlboros, but they're doing it anyway. And so what's plotted here is the percentage of participants in the lowest nicotine content group for the trial I just showed you, who said, yes, I cheated in the last week of the trial. You told me not to, but I smoked my own cigarettes. And we can take the urine that participants provide at the end of six weeks and we can ask whether or not um, we think that they cheated in addition to what they told us. And these are those data. So the vast majority of participants in the trial are cheating and they're lying about it. <laughs> so, so that makes it really difficult for us to ask about what would happen in a regulatory world where people can't smoke normal nicotine content cigarettes legally. So that's the question. Would smokers then compensate, would they smoke 100 times more very low nicotine content cigarettes if they couldn't cheat and smoke their own cigarettes? And again, this is really difficult to answer in a clinical trial because we can't lock people up and keep them from getting to the store to buy their own cigarettes. People are doing it even though we're asking them not to. And so the way that we address this question, as Eric alluded to, is that we take a bunch of smokers and we lock them up in a hotel. So we search their stuff on the way in, nobody in, nobody out. We exclusively give them research cigarettes to smoke while they're at the hotel. We serve them all of their meals while they're in the hotel. We provide them with a lot of games and activities. There's charades, there's friendship bracelet making. <laughs> and then we track their smoking over a period of time, as well as a lot of other outcomes. And so then we can ask, in the context of complete compliance, are people compensating? And so the design of the study is that we had a cohort of participants who came into the study together. They're there from a Monday to Friday period, five days. Monday and Friday are half days, so it's really four 24-hour periods. While they're there the first time, they exclusively smoke the normal nicotine content research cigarettes. And then they go home, they spend a week at home washing out, they come back, they do the exact same thing again, except now they exclusively smoke the very low nicotine content cigarettes. We wanted to make this as real world as we possibly could, and in the real world, people are buying their cigarettes. We also wanted to prevent a ceiling effect where people are just sitting around smoking all day because they have nothing else to do and then we can't observe any compensation. So in order to do that, all of the participants bought their cigarettes from a cigarette store that we created, and the only cigarettes for sale in our cigarette store were the Spectrum cigarettes. We gave people a study bank that they could use to buy the cigarettes, and then at the end of the week, any money that was left in their account, they got to take with them. So it is real money. There is an incentive not to just sit there and smoke all day. After a lot of deliberation, we opted to make the study unblinded, which is different from the clinical trials I've showed you. And the reason that we did that is because we decided that in the real world, if this happens, it's something that people will likely know about. And that some people will be carrying expectancies about what will happen. Some people might expect themselves to compensate or smoke more because they know that their cigarette has less nicotine in them. And if that was going to happen and be a source of compensation, we wanted to allow for that. So participants, when they got to the hotel, were told the nicotine content of their cigarettes. So for example, when participants arrived for the very low nicotine content condition, we told them, all of the cigarettes provided to you and other participants during this hotel stay have a very low nicotine content. The nicotine content is about 97% less than what would be available in a typical cigarette purchased on the market today. So what happened? What's plotted here is the number of cigarettes smoked per day and the normal nicotine content condition across the four 24-hour periods. So N and C for normal nicotine content. We can compare that to the very low nicotine content condition. And what you see is that in the very low nicotine content condition, there's not a significant increase across any of the four 24-hour periods in cigarettes smoked per day. 
to me, there does look like there might be a small, non-significant increase on the second full day, but that is certainly gone or even reversed by days three and four. That's really consistent with the variety of smoke and toxin, toxicant exposure biomarkers that we collected. So what's plotted here is expired carbon monoxide. People showed up and gave CO samples four times a day while they're in the hotel. So what's plotted here are the five days, Monday and Friday are half days, so there are fewer collections on those days. And what you see is in the normal nicotine content condition, CO is lower in the morning and then increases and stays higher throughout the rest of the day as people smoke. We can compare that to the very low nicotine content condition. And what you see again, there's no significant increase in CO in the VLNC condition. But people, in the, to me, it looks like in the afternoon of days two and three, there is this small, non-significant increase in very low nicotine content in CO in the VLNC condition. That is certainly gone or even reversed by days four and five. So these data are reassuring because they show that there's really no evidence of sustained compensation, even in this context of complete compliance where people can't cheat. The goal of this study was not to ask about withdrawal, it was to ask about compensation, but people ask me about withdrawal all the time because it's a really the type of place where if there was going to be withdrawal, you would certainly see it, right? People know they're smoking low nicotine cigarettes and people can't cheat and mitigate that with other sources of nicotine. So we did do the 15 item MNWS across every single morning when participants were in the hotel. This is the normal nicotine content condition. And when you compare that to the VLNC condition, there is a consistent increase that's relatively mild. And this is a significant increase in withdrawal. When you ask about which symptoms is it, what kind of withdrawal are we observing? These are the 15 items. What's plotted here is the percentage increase in the, that symptom during the low nicotine week. And so what you're seeing, certainly the biggest symptoms where we're seeing the biggest increase and the ones that are significant are the mood-related symptoms. So angry, irritable, frustrated, and impatient. And that is what participants tell us as well, is that they're feeling irritable and struggling in that way. So it's likely that in the context of complete compliance, if smokers can't mitigate their withdrawal in other ways, that we're likely to see some mild mood-related withdrawal. I will note that even though there was some mood-related withdrawal, no one left the study, everybody made it, and people generally had a positive things to say about being part of it. Okay, so what have I shown you? I've shown you that nicotine reduction is likely to reduce cigarettes per day among current smokers. There appears to be decreased smoking initiation among naive individuals. There's no evidence of sustained compensation, and that's true even in the context where smokers are unable to access normal nicotine content cigarettes. I wanna just take the very last minute and talk about where I am now and where I see my science going, which is a little bit different than what I've talked about so far. So when I started this talk, I introduced the idea of product regulation to target the addictiveness of combustible tobacco products. But there's also the potential to use product regulation for the other side of the equation, to target non-combustible products. As everybody is aware, there are a variety of non-combustible products that have come on the market over the last couple of years. And in the US, we've even seen things like Icos and Puff Bar this year. And those, those products vary on a wide range of characteristics that the FDA could regulate if appropriate for the protection of public health. But we don't really have a lot of information about how those characteristics matter, what the impact of those characteristics is on reinforcement value and use, especially for current smokers who might be interested in switching to a less harmful product. Which products and which characteristics are important for trying a product that competes well with cigarettes and is going to allow them to switch completely? So I have a variety of studies that are going right now that focus on that question. What is the impact of e-cigarette product characteristics on reinforcement value and use? I have a recently published study that I don't have time to show you on PGVG ratio, and then ongoing studies that focus on e-liquid nicotine concentration, e-cigarette device power, comparing generations, so for example, comparing a mod to a pod-based system like a Juul, comparing uh, salt e-liquid to freebase e-liquid, and comparing the reinforcement value of different types of products like e-cigarette and heat not burn. And all of these studies focus on the impact on reinforcement value and use for current smokers who are trying to switch to a less harmful product. I'm also interested in the interplay between the two types of research I talked about today. So if we target the addictiveness of cigarettes, if we make them minimally addictive or non-addictive, they will be relatively less reinforcing than non-combusted products. And then the characteristics of those non-combustible products are likely to be more important. 
And I think it's important for us to ask about the impact of nicotine reduction on e-cigarette initiation. I think this could be particularly an important question to ask about in the context of that hotel setting that I described, where participants can't cheat and mitigate their withdrawal using other types of um, cigarettes and combustible products, and they would have a product like Juul available to them. I want to just end by thanking a lot of people who contributed not only to the studies that I talked about today, but to my professional development and growth as a scientist, and so to this award. Um, you guys heard Eric's voice at the start of this. Eric was my PhD mentor at the University of Pittsburgh and is really responsible for my training as a scientist um, early on, as well as my interest in product regulation, and I couldn't be more grateful to him. My mentor at the Medical University of South Carolina, Matt Carpenter, has been incredibly influential in helping me transition into a faculty independent role, um, as well as broadening my horizons to non-combusted products, and so I'm so grateful for that. And thank you so much. Do we have time? I don't know. We have time for one or two questions, if anyone has any. Uh, hello, thank you for, for the work and, and for the presentation, and congratulations. Uh, I'm Stephen Binns, a research scientist at NRC at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm curious about other, uh, well, yeah, you talked um, about compensation. I'm wondering about substitution with cigars, cigarillos, hookah, given that the industry is so agile in responding to regulation. Yeah, so um, that is a great question to ask Mitch Zeller. Um, I wish you were here. So in the clinical trials that I described before, we don't see a lot of that type of substitution. I think it's important to note that we've really seen a rise in other tobacco product in the last several years that we might not have observed earlier. Um, also that people are cheating and smoking their own cigarettes, and that's a lot easier to do than switching to little cigars. Um, I think that it is likely that if we implement a nicotine reduction policy, you will see substitution of either other combustible products or non-combustible products. It is my position that a nicotine reduction policy should apply to all combustible products, um, but that's not up to me, and um, so we'll see. One more question. In our previous plenary session today, we were encouraged to be positive and not negative in talking to people about their efforts to quit smoking, and so knowing that people are not being upfront honest about their use of their addictive product, you know, what, whatever it is, wondered if you'd make some comments about the literature that you read in preparation for your trial. Um, and I know I have patients coming to me and saying, oh yeah, I smoke two packs a day and their CO level is this high and their nicotine levels are this high and I know they're smoking more than two packs a day, but without that biochemical confirmation, I can't have that discussion with them, right? Without being negative or whatever. Could you make some comments about knowing that your patients are using more than they say they are? Um, I think I understand the question, but in relation to thinking about conducting the science, that's why that, um, that's why those normal nicotine content controls have been so important because, for example, in the hotel study, um, we had conducted a previous study that Eric alluded to where we didn't have the normal nicotine content condition. We had people just go from their homes to a very low nicotine content control hotel, um, and people smoke more in the hotel. And we didn't know if that was because they were compensating or because of the context and people um, not being honest about their rate of smoking at home. And so um, for these types of studies, that's why the, the control group is so important. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tracy. And uh, please welcome, join me in uh, giving Tracy a round of applause. That was fabulous. <laughs> It is another tremendous honor to be able to introduce today's policy plenary talk um, as we've been planning this conference. You know, we get abstracts in and we get, uh, we've, the reviews come in and then we meet in October to look at the conference and to look at what's come in. And it was so exciting to see a symposium session come in on the new Surgeon General's report on smoking cessation. If you can put my slides up. So we thought that this was uh, of tremendous importance and interest to the membership and decided to elevate this to be a policy plenary for this year's meeting. And we're so honored to have the Surgeon General here to introduce the report and to talk about the important findings. 
Dr. Jerome Adams is the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. His mission as the nation's doctor is to advance the health of the American people, and his motto is better health through better partnerships. Hello. Hello. <laughs> We're going to do the... We're going to do the... <laughs> so as the Surgeon General, Dr. Adams holds the rank of Vice Admiral in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Mm -hmm. In this capacity, he oversees the operations of approximately 6,500 uniformed health officers who serve in nearly 800 locations around the world, promoting, practicing, and advancing the health and safety of our nation. Amen. He's a doctor. He's a public health professional. We are so honored to have him here today. Uh, we have a few other speakers as well who will be joining uh, via WebEx, who are senior editors on the report. And uh, I just have to say, going to your website, I know you have a lot on your plate right now. Just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> but uh, we see your commitment to tobacco control on this page. There's who is the Surgeon General, the next topic is e-cigarette prevention. The third is tobacco reports and publications. Your dedication to the field and to this work is so important and really evidenced by you being here today. Thank you so much for joining us, and I turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Glad to be here. <clears throat> good well, good afternoon, everyone. Oh my gosh, everyone stand up for a second. Stand up, <laughs> shake it out, shake it out a little bit. Roll your heads around. And the other way. All right, deep breath in. And out. And in. And out. All right, now we're ready, now we're ready. Okay, grab a seat. Good afternoon, everyone. Much better, much better. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And uh, because it's the elephant in the room, we're going to start off talking about COVID. And uh, I want to first of all say to each and every one of you that I really encourage you throughout the rest of this meeting and throughout the next several weeks to really try to be safe. Try to be safe. Try to think about those basic, basic public health practices that we know will help keep us safe. And I want to applaud SRNT and the staff of SRNT and the Hilton for taking measures to keep you all safe. And uh, we actually had a meeting yesterday before uh, I came here, and I said, I want to know what you all are doing to help keep the people who are the SRNT participants safe. And uh, I got to tell you, they had a plan that was more than 10 points for all the things that they were doing to make sure you had hand sanitizer available, to make sure you all were able to practice social distancing, to make sure you understood all the different things that uh, you could do and that they were doing, including we talked about keeping the doors open so you wouldn't have to pull back and forth on door handles and touch door handles. But, but again, really want you all to, uh, to be safe. I want to give you some COVID-19 context because <clears throat> there are a lot of people um, who are probably surprised that I'm here right now. Well, uh, it's important for us to understand that more people are going to die in the next hour from smoking-related illnesses than have died in the United States from COVID-19 so far. And uh, one of the challenges of being Surgeon General is everyone wants me to lift up their issue. And it's important for me to help America keep things in perspective, but also important uh, for, uh, for all of you to help people understand that we can't forget about one problem our society has when we're focusing on another problem, because we may end up net losing overall. And so important that we continue to lift up the impact that tobacco has on our country. And it's also important to know that the people who are most at risk for COVID-19 are those with chronic diseases, diseases like heart disease and lung disease, diseases that are 
disproportionately caused by and exacerbated by smoking. So one of the things we can do to help keep our country safe from COVID-19 is to help keep people from starting smoking and help people uh, stop smoking. Amen. All right, I got, got, got one out there. I have a, a three-part prescription for America to help them stay safe from COVID-19 that I want to go over really quickly. Number one is know your risk. And we've learned a lot about this disease. Interestingly enough, 80% uh, of people who uh, have been diagnosed with COVID-19 actually have a mild disease or no symptoms. Important for people to understand, there will be more cases. Most people are going to be fine. Most people are going to be just fine. Of that 20% who go on to need medical attention, uh, there is a smaller subset that will have severe disease and die. And uh, we know a lot about that group now, too. We know that, it, that it's uh, mainly 80-year-olds, 80-plus-year-olds uh, who have chronic medical conditions. So a lot of our focus now is really on making sure we're protecting the most vulnerable, protecting the most vulnerable, um, while helping everyone else understand that, yes, by the time all this is said and done, many of you all in this room, if not all of you, will know someone who has been diagnosed with COVID, and many of, all of, many of you, and hopefully all of you, will be able to say they got through it just fine. They got through it just fine. So know your risk, number one, because when you know your risk, then you can make appropriate decisions. If you are a 60-plus-year-old with chronic medical conditions, you should not be here right now. You should not be in large public gatherings because you are at higher risk, which leads to number two, understand your circumstances and environment. Once you know your risk, then you've got to say, okay, uh, because we've all got to keep living our lives. Then you've got to say, okay, am I planning on going to the movies? Well, I'm at higher risk. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Am I planning on going? Uh, someone asked me earlier about whether or not they should go to a wedding next weekend in Georgia. Well, I said, again, if you are at high risk or you're coming back home to someone who is at high risk, then maybe you shouldn't get on a train and go several states away to go to a wedding. Uh, understand your work environment. Is telework an option? Uh, are you planning on going to church this Sunday? Uh, making sure, again, you know your risk and then you understand your environment and circumstances. And then the third point of my prescription is know how to protect yourself and your community. And I would encourage you to go to coronavirus.gov for updates, and we update that website daily with information on coronavirus. I've done a lot of interviews over the last two weeks. There is not a question I've been asked by an interviewer that isn't addressed on coronavirus.gov. And your state departments of health all have great information uh, tailored to your state so that you can understand, do I live in a hot spot? Because again, that's part of knowing your environment and your circumstances. You're gonna behave differently in Seattle right now or in uh, New York right now than what you're gonna behave in Louisiana. But you can find out that information by going to your State Department of Health website. Coronavirus.gov has information out there about how you can stay safe, uh, tailored to specific audiences, individuals, families, workplaces, schools, places of worship. Now is the time for us to prepare, and I don't wanna downplay the seriousness of this any more than I downplay the seriousness of 20,000 people dying from the flu in this country so far this year. It is not, our, not, not what we're trying to do in terms of downplaying the seriousness, but we want to prepare and not panic. It is my belief as Surgeon General that more people will die from misinformation, from panic, from stigma and discrimination as a result of COVID-19 than are going to die from the actual virus. And so we need all of you to help spread the facts and not fear and to, again, help people understand this is going to be a rough ride for the next couple of weeks. But if we come together and do the things that we know are effective in preventing the spread of infectious diseases, we'll be safer from COVID. We'll actually have less flu deaths. The silver lining here is that we're in the midst of a terribly bad flu season, and I would be telling all of you anyway to use hand sanitizer and to practice social distancing from people who are sick, and maybe we'll save a few lives from the flu, and we will get through this. Now, um, let me get back to why I'm here. Uh, I wanna say thank you to all of you because it's because of you that we were able to release smoking cessation, a report of the Surgeon General. I'm gonna go over some highlights from that report. Despite substantial progress 
in the areas of smoking cessation. And important to understand, we are at historically low levels of smoking in this country thanks to the people in this room. But 34 million Americans still smoke. The good news is that 70% of US adults who currently smoke cigarettes say they want to quit. Not enough people know that. It's important for you all to be tweeting out through your social media channels, helping other people understand, because there's this misconception out there that people are smoking because they want to smoke and they don't want to quit, and by golly, they're a lost cause. And far too many people think that, but 70% of smokers want to quit. It's very personal to me, as I lost both of my grandfathers to smoking-related illnesses. I grew up with asthma, watching both of my grandfathers smoke, riding in the car with them, uh, having my asthma exacerbated, watching one die of a stroke and the other die of lung cancer. And I often wonder if one or both of them would have lived to see my children, their great-grandchildren, if they'd had more help quitting. Tobacco dependence is a chronic, an often relapsing condition that is driven by an addiction to nicotine. As a result, quitting smoking is often one of the hardest things a person can do in their life. And uh, I don't want to jump around on too many tangents here, but uh, my brother is actually in a rehab facility right now for uh, his heroin addiction. And many of you have heard me talk about that. I've heard him and other people say that quitting cigarettes was harder than quitting heroin. It is one of the most addictive substances known to man, and uh, before people lose their minds, I am not comparing one to the other. I am telling you that for some people out there, quitting cigarettes is as hard or harder than quitting opioids. But while quitting is hard, we know it is possible. In this report, this report that I hope you all have looked at, the executive summary, it's on my website, includes the latest science on interventions that have been proven to help people quit smoking. We know a lot about the benefits of keeping people from starting smoking, but this report highlights that quitting smoking is one of the most important actions a person can take to improve their health. And I know you all get this, but important for people to understand because uh, people will say, well, Surgeon General's been talking about smoking for, for years. 34 different reports, what's new about this? Well, what's new is that 32 of the other reports all essentially said starting smoking is bad for your health. This is just the second one ever, and uh, the first one was 34 years ago, that actually says that, that quitting smoking is effective in terms of promoting your health. So if you are a loved one or a smoker who has tried to quit or wants to quit, the fact is there's literally never been a better time to make a quit attempt. We know more than we ever have about the science of quitting. In the three decades since the first Surgeon General's report came out on smoking, the world has changed dramatically. We didn't have our smartphones back then. We didn't have social media. We didn't have FDA-approved smoking cessation medications. And with research, medical advances, and years of documented experience in tobacco control, again, we know more than ever about the science of quitting. My report highlights the broader systems of support and policy interventions that encourage, accelerate, and sustain quitting success. And it further addresses the health benefits derived from quitting smoking by subcategories and the unique populations who disproportionately face the burdens of tobacco use. Cigarette smoking has declined considerably from nearly 43% when the 1964 Surgeon General's report was published. Back then, almost half our country was smoking. We are now at a historic low of 14%, and it represents one of the greatest public health achievements of the past century, and for that, you should give yourselves a round of applause. But again, 34 million U.S. adults still smoke. Smoking remains the largest preventable cause of disease, death, and disability in our country. It harms nearly every organ of the body. Nearly half a million Americans die from smoking each and every year. And cigarettes are, to the best of my knowledge, the only legally sold product that, when directed, kills half the people who use them. In addition to the human toll, there's a fiscal cost to our country, $300 billion with a B dollars each and every year. So helping more people quit with the tools in this report isn't just the fastest approach to improving our nation's physical health. 
It's also the fastest approach to improving our fiscal health. And a whole lot of people are worried about the stock market out there right now. They're worried about our businesses. Number two cost for most companies is healthcare expenses. Number one driver of healthcare cost are the people who are still smoking and aren't being given the tools and the opportunity and the advice to help them quit. The report, and again, this is an executive summary, contains 700 pages of the latest science around smoking cessation, was the result of an enormous undertaking by many contributors, many of whom are in the audience. Do we have any contributors here? If, you are, if you're here and you contributed to my report, can you stand up? Nobody in the audience who contributed? Well, the authors aren't here, but you all contributed to this report. You all helped with the studies, with the science, with the enthusiasm that allowed us to write this report. It's been developed over three years by a senior scientific editorial team through coordination with the CDC using the same scientifically rigorous peer-reviewed standard that has been the hallmark of U.S. Surgeon General's reports on tobacco since their inception. And this is important, too, because uh, people are attacking institutions of government now for a variety of reasons. People are, are questioning whether or not you can trust the science anymore. It is important to understand, Surgeon General's reports are the gold standard on which everything else out there is based in terms of how you conduct a review of the data. More than 200 individuals worked to compile this review. And uh, Dr. Jillian Schauer, uh, is she gonna be still sharing the stage virtually with us afterwards? All right, wonderful, and I'm glad you're gonna get to ask her some questions. Although they couldn't be here today, I'd also like to personally thank my colleagues at the CDC, and especially the Office on Smoking and Health, with a special shout out to Brian King, Leslie Norman, and Corinne Grafunder, uh, the director of the Office of Smoking and Health. And finally, a sincere thanks to our state local and national partners, again, many of whom are in the room today. Without you all, this report wouldn't have been possible. Now to turn to the report itself. It is comprised of over 101 chapter conclusions and 10 major conclusions overall. Again, please go to surgeongeneral.gov, take a look at them. Uh, the report, it documents an array of effective clinical and health systems interventions for treating tobacco use and dependence and it further reviews the evidence on the effects of population-based policies. So we've got many tiers uh, at which we can uh, lean in to smoking cessation uh, and interventions on smoking. To provide context for the report itself, I wanna quickly walk through what we know from the major conclusions of the report. We know that quitting smoking can add years. Did I hit a button? Or did, they just didn't wanna see me anymore. Well. Quitting smoking, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful, you can leave those up there. It's beneficial at any age, and this is true whether you are 27 or 72. It is never too early or too late to quit. That one's important to me because you've got a lot of folks out there who say, I've been smoking for 30 years, 40 years. What's the point of quitting right now? Uh, it's, the damage is already done. This report shows that at any age, you can get a better quality of life and live longer if you quit smoking. Quitting smoking can lower a person's risk of early death and add as much as a decade to their life expectancy. Let the significance of that sink in. Quitting smoking can add 10 years to a person's life. That can be the difference between seeing your son or your niece graduate from high school. That can be the difference between watching your daughter get married and dancing with her at her wedding. 10 years. That can be the difference between whether or not you see your kids or your grandkids or your great-grandkids play their first baseball game or have their first soccer game. Again, smoking is costly. Findings included in the report highlight that quitting smoking can reduce financial burden on individual smokers themselves. And I love this. Uh, it's, uh, talking to a guy who uh, we added up the individual cost of smoking, and uh, he goes, well, heck, with that much money, I could buy a new truck. Well, yes, you could. And we need to do a better job of helping people understand how much that pack of cigarettes a day or every couple of days actually adds up to if we can help them quit smoking. Because in many cases, that may be the motivation they need to start on their pathway 
to being uh, nicotine free. It also talks about private and public health care systems financial burdens and society's financial burden from smoking. And quitting smoking reduces the risk for serious health conditions, including 12 different types of cancer, all laid out in the report, heart disease, lung disease, and reproductive health systems. It's interesting, and they, they, they don't like when I say this, but I think we should be telling more people this. Your love life will improve if you quit smoking. And the Surgeon General and the report that we have out there now says that. So every time you see that commercial about that little blue pill, think about the fact that we should have a, per, a commercial with a red report <laughs> saying, we can improve your love life if you quit smoking. So the science is clear about the benefits of quitting smoking from a health and an economic perspective. But again, important to know that half of adults who smoke try to quit in any given year, but face many challenges. And these are laid out in the report. Over 40% of smokers and this was the most shocking statistic to me as a provider. 40% of smokers who see a health provider each year are not advised by their health providers to quit. They are not. 40% are seeing a health pr provider not being told to quit. Why is that? Because I'm a dermatologist and you came to me for your eczema. You didn't come to me to get lectured to about smoking. I'm an OBGYN. You came from your annual pelvic exam. You didn't come to be lectured to me about smoking. Well, uh, as a doctor, we took an oath to heal people. And uh, by golly, yes, I want to take care of your eczema, but your quality of life is likely to be, is going to be improved to a greater extent, and you're going to live longer if we lean into your smoking and take just 30 seconds to ask, advise, and refer you to the quit line uh, as uh, any other thing that I can lean into. Two-thirds of smokers who try to quit don't use FDA-approved medications and counseling, which have been proven to increase the probability of quitting. And I know there's a lot of people out there who, uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to say a lot, but there are people out there who, uh, who knock some of the FDA-approved quit medications. The fact is, there are seven FDA-approved quit medications. There are different options for different people. And uh, combined with behavioral counseling, they double your chances of quitting. They double it. Another challenge is that disparities in smoking and cessation behaviors persist in our nation. And as a black man who has lost several family members to smoking, I think it's important that we lift that up. The prevalence of cigarette smoking remains highest among persons with a GED, persons with behavioral health and substance use disorders. The report says 40% of the combustible cigarettes in this country are consumed by people with a behavioral health and substance use disorder. 40%. Why? Because we think they have bigger fish to fry. But if you help them quit smoking, you empower them, and you actually improve their behavioral health. Persons uh, who are Medicaid enrollees and the uninsured smoke at higher rates. American Indian and Alaska Natives smoke at higher rates. Members of the LGBTQ community smoke at higher rates and don't quit as often. Persons who live in the Midwestern and Southern regions of the United States, and I've seen it just walking on the streets here in Louisiana. Many more people smoking here than in Washington, D.C. We need to make sure we're targeting our interventions to the persons who are most at risk. Persons with a low annual household income and then disabled persons. So again, 34 million Americans still smoking. The problem is that where I live in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, I don't see many of these people on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of our country thinks we've got this smoking problem licked. And it's up to you all to make sure we dig in to those communities that are most affected and give them the tools so that they can quit. We learned that cigarette smoking can vary greatly among other subgroups. A smaller percentage of Hispanic and Latino adults overall smoke, but the number of cigarettes smoked per day is highest among Cuban and Mexican smokers than smokers from other Hispanic and Latino groups. Smoking cessation opportunities including quit attempts, receiving advice to quit from a health professional, and using cessation therapies also vary greatly across populations. And as an example, African Americans are less successful at quitting than white and Hispanic cigarette smokers. We need to dig deeper into why that is and lean into those communities with culturally and ethnically sensitive interventions. We know, we know these disparities may be affected by variables such as receiving advice to quit from a health professional and being advised to use evidence-based cessation treatment 
as well as differences in state and local tobacco control policies, health care coverage, and tobacco product marketing. We know the tobacco industry has a long history of marketing to many of these subpopulations that I talked about. So there's still much more work to be done, and this report helps us understand where and how we should be targeting our efforts. While quitting smoking may be easy, it may not be easy, it is possible, especially when people who want to quit, and again, 70% of smokers want to quit, 50% make a quit attempt every year, are connected to proven treatments that are both safe and effective. Behavioral counseling and FDA-approved quit medications are effective, uh, and uh, they, they are cost-effective, and they increase a person's chance of successfully quitting. We know counseling is now available in a variety of formats, including individual, group, and one-on-one -on -one counseling over quit lines. And we know the times are also evolving, so we must evolve when it comes to offering cessation services. The report tells us text messaging services are effective in increasing quit rates, encouraging people, checking in on them, as are web or internet-based interventions to ensure people who want to quit have meaningful access to counseling and medications. The report tells us that the health systems and payer levels having comprehensive barrier-free insurance coverage for cessation services is important. And I'm excited about this because more people are talking about outcomes-based reimbursement. We need to take advantage of that to help people understand it is a very pound-foolish and penny-foolish uh, decision to not make barrier-free smoking cessation uh, services available to everyone who wants to quit. According to our report, comprehensive coverage and promotion can increase the use of these treatments, leads to higher rates of successful quitting, and is cost-effective. Having highlighted the report's findings about strategies at the individual and systems levels, I want to finish on population-level strategies, because again, there are things we need to do for each and every patient. There are things our health systems need to do, but there are things that our policymakers need to know about and that you all need to lean into. This report details a number of interventions proven to decrease smoking on a population level, including raising the price of cigarettes, adopting smoke-free policies, implementing mass media campaigns, and requiring pictorial health warnings on cigarette packaging. We do these reports so that you all can go to your state legislatures and local chambers of commerce and say, we need to do this in our community because the Surgeon General of the United States says it's a best practice. It's also important to support fully funded, comprehensive statewide tobacco control programs. And while discussing interventions and innovations that can help individuals quit smoking, the question is inevitably raised about the potential role of e-cigarettes. So, I want to address this issue starting with the language of the major conclusion related to e-cigarettes that's included in the report. E-cigarettes, and this is the language I'm reading here verbatim, and I want to remind you again, gold standard, 200 experts from all across the world looked at the data and decided that this was the appropriate language to summarize the most currently available data on e-cigarettes in terms of whether or not they help people quit smoking. E-cigarettes are a continually changing and diverse group of products that are used in a variety of ways. Therefore, it is difficult to make generalizations about their effectiveness for cessation based on studies of a particular e-cigarette. And the 200 people who contributed to this report said, there is presently inadequate evidence to conclude that e-cigarettes in general increase smoking cessation. Now, I've heard powerful accounts from many individuals, and any of you all who follow me online know that there is no shortage of powerful accounts on my social media feed from individuals who have used e-cigarettes to quit smoking. But this report is based on experts reviewing the totality of scientific data about what works on a population level to help people quit. And these experts concluded that more research is needed on whether, how, and which e-cigarettes might be an effective quit aid and to better understand the health effects of e-cigarettes. And I say that to you all not as an admonition, but as a challenge. We need more research. We need you all to look at which types of e-cigarettes, which dosage, uh, which uh, additives, uh, which 
combinations, which subpopulations um, are, are going to be effective to help people quit so that we can make a real and genuine recommendation to people that is based on the science. It's also important to note that irrespective of ongoing research related to e-cigarettes as a potential cessation tool for adult smokers, this cannot, it must not, it will not come at the expense of escalating rates of use, use of these products. So I want to be clear, e-cigarettes are not safe for youth, for young adults, for pregnant women, and for adults who currently do not use tobacco products. And we have to continue to message that while we're doing the research to figure out when, where, how, if e-cigarettes are in, on a population level an effective cessation aid for adults who smoke. I know this was a lot of information. Hopefully it provides a snapshot of the richness of scientific data and findings included in the 700 pages of this overall report. I would have brought the other one, but it was too big to fit in my suitcase. Um, but findings like those contained in the report are crucial to inform ongoing efforts around smoking cessation. And we know that the science will continue to evolve and help to improve our understanding of what works to help people quit. I want America to know that smoking cessation, a report of the Surgeon General, is a blueprint for continued, coordinated, and collective action amongst each, each of us as stakeholders. The intent behind the development and release of Surgeon General's reports is not only to report on the science, but to encourage application of the science to improve the health of our nation. Otherwise, those 700 pages are just a doorstop sitting in my office. Most of the 34 million American adults in America who smoke cigarettes want to quit. It is incumbent upon all of us to connect them with the effective treatments and the motivation to help them do so. We need to really lean into the barriers that are preventing them from doing what they already want to do, but are finding it difficult to do. We know coordinated efforts providing treatment and support across multiple sectors can help people quit smoking for good. Equipped with both the science and the resolve, we have the ability to end the tobacco epidemic in America. Working together, we can take the completely preventable tragedy of tobacco-related disease, disability, and death, and make it a thing of the past so that no other Surgeon General has to stand before you and tell you that he lost both of his grandfathers due to smoking-related illness. In closing, I want to thank SRNT for inviting me to speak today, for making accommodations to keep all of you and to keep me safe. And I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing to help make America healthier and to help make America tobacco-free. Thank you. I'm not sure they've looped us into the stage yet. We can hear you now. So we're going to move on to presentations from senior scientific editors on the report. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adams, for your leadership on this important public health issue. I am Dr. Rachel Grana from the National Cancer Institute's Tobacco Control Research Branch. And it is my true honor to be here, even if virtually, with Dr. Schauer to represent the senior scientific editorial team and share the important findings of this 2020 SGR on smoking cessation. This report, uh, as Dr. Adams uh, highlighted, was prepared by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and was coordinated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with the Office of Smoking and Health and HHS in the Office of the Surgeon General. And these are the scientific editors as well as the managing editorial team. And it really is uh, an honor to have shared this process with them. All of the funding to develop the report was provided by the US government and therefore there's no industry funding and we will not discuss any off-label medication uses today. 
So as Dr. Adams reviewed, this is a very carefully constructed and standardized process to develop a Surgeon General's report and takes time to execute. The report was compiled using a peer-reviewed, balanced, comprehensive process, which is really designed to maximize scientific rigor and partiality. And under the leadership of the team of senior scientific editors, the report chapters were written on the topics that people are experts on. The content of the report was peer-reviewed by additional experts. Following that peer review, even more senior scientists and other experts examined the scientific integrity of the entire report. And after that process, the whole report goes to agency clearance. And now we are at the gratifying stage where we get to share it with an important audience like all of you here today. I also want to highlight the many companion materials that were expertly prepared that are both in print and online and carefully created to reach the public and our intended audiences, of course, for use in our communities and clinics to ensure we can put these findings into action and help people who smoke and use tobacco. And as these numbers show and were highlighted earlier, the development of this Surgeon General's report is an incredible effort by hundreds of people, including 32 chapter authors, 46 peer reviewers, 20 senior scientists. That has now culminated in eight very comprehensive chapters on this topic, 10 major conclusions, which were so expertly highlighted by Dr. Adams, and 101 chapter conclusions. So really a quite monumental achievement. And as has been the standard for Surgeon General's reports for many years, this report utilizes a four-level hierarchy of categorization for interpreting the evidence. So I wanted to make sure that we all understood what those are today. So the four categories are that the evidence is sufficient to infer a causal relationship, the evidence is suggestive but not sufficient to infer a causal relationship, the evidence is inadequate to infer the presence or absence of a causal relationship, or the evidence is suggestive of no causal relationship. And consistent with past SGRs on tobacco, there are frequently offered recommendations for research policies or actions that are not just limited to those causal categories made in the report. As you heard from Dr. Adams, this is the first Surgeon General's report since 1990 to focus solely on quitting smoking and highlights what we've really learned about smoking cessation over the past 30 years. The report was organized into these eight chapters covering patterns of use, new biological insights into cessation, health benefits of cessation, benefits on morbidity, mortality, and the economic costs, smoking cessation interventions, and the population strategies that promote and support cessation, as well as a vision for the future steps to maximize the benefits of smoking cessation for all. It also touches on areas with implications for smoking cessation, like e-cigarettes and the regulatory approaches like reducing nicotine content in cigarettes. So Chapter 1 mainly focuses on providing an overview of the report and the current landscape of smoking cessation since the 1990 report and contains the 10 major conclusions, which Dr. Adams already presented today. So Dr. Schauer and I are really going to focus on drilling down just a bit further to some of the major findings from each of the remaining seven chapters. I'm going to focus on Chapters 2 to 4, and then Dr. Schauer will focus on Chapters 5 to 8 in remarks today. Let's begin with Chapter 2. Chapter 2 documents the key patterns and trends in cigarette smoking cessation in the United States. It primarily focused on adult data, but there are data and conclusions about cessation among youth and young adults as well that I'm not going to have time to go into today, but I think are very important to highlight and that you all know that that is there. So some of the major evidence review really illustrated that in the U.S. we've had a lot of progress in the past 30 years. More than three out of every five adults who were ever cigarette smokers have quit smoking. And by measures of smoking cessation behavior, past year quit attempts and recent and longer term cessation have also increased in the past two decades among adult cigarette smokers. But as Dr. Adams really emphasized and drove home nicely for everybody, we have a lot of progress to make. Despite these encouraging indicators, 34 million Americans still smoke, 
and cigarette smoking remains the highest among certain subpopulations, such as people with mental health conditions and substance use disorders, low SCS um, status, Medicaid enrollees, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender adults, and American Indians and Alaska Natives. In addition, there are marked disparities in the cessation behaviors as well by population subgroup. There are very um, important disparities like making a pass your quit attempt and achieving recent successful cessation across population subgroups defined by educational attainment, poverty status, age, health insurance status, and other indicators. And these disparities may be affected by systemic variables like lower levels of receiving advice from a health professional to quit and use less use of evidence-based treatments. However, since 2000, we do have we have seen an increase in smokers receiving advice from health professionals to quit, which is laudable. But we do have a disparity here still. 43% of adult cigarette smokers who saw a health professional during the past year still did not receive that advice to quit. And more adult cigarette smokers are using evidence-based cessation counseling or medication in their quit attempts. Yet two thirds of cigarette smokers who tried to quit in the past year did not use the evidence-based treatment. And there are disparities in receiving advice to quit and use of evidence-based treatment by age. Where younger smokers are more likely to be young, lighter smokers and non-daily, they're often not identified by a healthcare professional systematically or offered the advice to quit. And a large proportion of adult smokers report using non-evidence-based approaches when trying to quit smoking, such as switching to other tobacco products. So, which also highlights the need to really um, reach people with these evidence-based treatments. And um, you'll hear more about interventions to support this in chapters that uh, Dr. Shower will review. This graph shows the quit ratio over time since about the first SGR, 1965 to 2017. This metric represents the per percentage of adult ever smokers who have quit smoking and is defined as the number of former smokers divided by the number of ever smokers. So um, this is a trend over time demonstrating that there's an increasing, increasing trend in the population based quit ratio since 1965. For example, you can turn your attention to um, some recent years from 2012 to 2017, where you can see a six percentage point increase in the quit ratio. And the quit ratio has been consistently higher among older adults versus younger adults. So while, and taken together, the findings of this chapter really highlight that while we've made significant progress, there's still more work to do to address these disparities in particular, increase our reach and utilization of evidence-based treatment. Chapter three focuses on how biology can influence smoking cessation. This is a pretty um, dense chapter for many of us, including us behavioral scientists. <laughs> um, and I think that what I really wanna emphasize here, I will review these major findings, um, but I do wanna emphasize the new and the new biological insights. And thus by nature, this, uh, is, this chapter is a little more explorative and covers some novel topics. And as such, not surprisingly, the conclusions in this chapter met the suggestive but not sufficient threshold. This type of work is really important to inform our ongoing dialogue about cessation, but these are very much emerging topics that warrant more nuanced research before stronger recommendations can be made. So this chapter, let me tell you a bit about um, how this chapter is organized and what it accomplished. Um, it really focused on four areas of intensive research domains that were that progress was made since the publication of the 2010 Surgeon General's report. The first domain is in the cellular and molecular biology of nicotine addiction. And this section describes the preclinical basis for understanding nicotine addiction and the ways that this knowledge can be used to enhance cessation. The second domain is vaccine and other immunotherapy. And this focuses on presenting the conceptual basis of vaccine treatment design progress that has been made, barriers that were encountered, as well as approaches to the next generation of research in this area. The third domain um, was evidence to reveal insights into smoking cessation from the field of neurobiology, focusing on our advances in understanding the brain circuitry involved in nicotine dependence, primarily through advances in brain imaging techniques, the roles of stress, craving, reward, and changes in cognitive control on addiction, and they provide further insight into the effects of smoking on the brain to identify new targets for cessation. 
The fourth air, uh, intensive research domain was on genetic studies of smoking phenotypes. This, this evidence review focused on our mechanistic understandings gained in recent years as well from the genetic literature as well as advances in methodological approaches that can be employed to understand this. So um, rather than read all of the conclusions on this slide, which would take um, a bit more time than we have today, I'm going to just summarize some of the major takeaways from this chapter. First, we have a lot of substantial research in the cellular and molecular mechanisms of nicotine addiction, including the rewarding properties of nicotine, withdrawal symptoms, and relapse. That is more well known. We have good animal models and a wide array of medications that target these various neurotransmitter systems, and new ones are in development. With regard to the vaccine research, the sum in summary, the nicotine vaccines are possible in the future. It, uh, based on research, they will be stimulating the immune system to produce antibodies that reduce or slow the delivery of nicotine to the brain. Um, that's the approach that seems to be taken. And animal studies have shown promising results, but more research is still really needed in humans, especially to um, reduce intolerable side effects. With respect to the brain imaging research, Brain imaging technologies such as MRI and fMRI have really been useful in helping us understand how the brain changes during nicotine addiction and how smoking cues and anti-smoking messages affect brain function. And the evidence from the genetic research reviewed in this chapter suggests that someday we may be able to tailor cessation treatments to genotypes. However, this chapter really underscores that more research is needed regarding nicotine dependence and the role genes play in smoking nicotine addiction and cessation. Turning now to chapter four, chapter four was a very extensive chapter. Um, it reviewed our knowledge of disease risks from smoking and really um, what is added in this report is how those disease risks are changed by and impacted by smoking cessation. It's organized into these effects by major type of chronic diseases like cancer, cardiovascular impacts, respiratory impacts, and a wide array of reproductive outcomes. So overall, the evidence re reviewed in this chapter shows that there are se in several areas of disease risk, smoking cessation reduces risk. With respect to cancer, the evidence is sufficient to infer that smoking cessation reduces the risk of 12 cancers. They are all listed on the slide. I won't read them for you uh, today. And the evidence is sufficient to infer that the relative risk of lung cancer decreases steadily after smoking cessation compared with the risk for persons continuing to smoke. With regard to cardiovascular disease, there are 15 chapter conclusions about the impact of smoking cessation on cardiovascular disease. But in summary, quitting smoking reduces the risk of morbidity and mortality and the burden of disease from cardiovascular disease and stroke. The risk of developing coronary heart disease drops rapidly after quitting and then declines more slowly over time. And there are many more um, substantial and sig where conclusions where the evidence is sufficient um, that, I, that you can see more in the report. For smokers already diagnosed with coronary heart disease, there were major conclusions of benefit. The evidence is sufficient to infer that quitting smoking can also improve outcomes for adults who have already been diagnosed with coronary heart disease. In patients who are current smokers when diagnosed, the evidence is sufficient to infer a causal relationship between smoking cessation and reduction in all-cause mortality. It's sufficient to infer a causal relationship between smoking cessation and reduction in deaths due to cardiac causes and sudden death. It's sufficient to infer that a causal relationship between smoking cessation and reduced risk of new and recurrent cardiac events. With regard to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, previous Surgeon General's report have really elucidated the many ways that tobacco smoke injures the lungs and causes respiratory injury and contributes to chronic respiratory disease and health benefits from smoking cessation for COPD. The present, present evidence review served to reinforce that quitting smoking remains the only known way for persons with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease to reduce their loss of lung function over time and for adults who currently smoke to reduce the risk of developing COPD. And the last subsection of chapter four 
um, under the health benefits covered the impact of cessation on several different different aspects of reproductive health, as evidenced by the 21 chapter conclusion. To summarize many of the main findings though here in brief, the evidence is sufficient to infer that smoking cessation by pregnant women benefits the health of them for themselves and that of their fetuses and newborns. The evidence is sufficient to infer that women who quit before or early in pregnancy gain more weight during gestation than those who continue to smoke. And the evidence is sufficient to infer that smoking cessation during pregnancy reduces the effects of smoking on fetal growth, such that quitting smoking early in pregnancy even eliminates the adverse effects of smoking on fetal growth. So what that means is that smoking cessation before or in early pregnancy reduces the risk of delivering a low birth weight baby. So as you can see, there are many um, very well-documented be uh, health benefits for smoking cessation. And now I'm going to hand things off to Dr. Jillian Schauer to provide an overview of the remaining chapters and a good wrap up of our presentation today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Grana. Um, are you going, do you want me to do the slides or are you gonna do that? No, that's okay. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and you can share. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> hello everybody, uh, this is Jillian Schauer. Hello from Seattle. Um, and my apologies that I can't be with you in person. Um, I'm a senior consultant for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as a co-director of the Tobacco Studies Program at the University of Washington. Um, let me just share my screen and I'll pick up where Dr. Grana left off at chapter five. Um, so chapter five uh, considers broad indicators of the burden in relation to smoking cessation. Hopefully it's launching for you, there you go. Um, and it includes morbidity and mortality, economic costs, and this type of information, I think the senior editors of the report felt was vital to include in this report because it can inform smokers about the potential benefits of quitting, and it can really serve as a strong rationale to provide interventions to help increase cessation. Um, so again, very briefly, we're just giving you highlights. Um, the sufficient level conclusions from this chapter um, span from the individual level to the system to society. There was sufficient evidence to conclude that smoking cessation improved well-being, quality of life, overall health status. There is also sufficient evidence that smoking cessation reduces mortality and increases the lifespan. And there was sufficient evidence that smoking has a high cost to smokers, health systems, and society. Um, there was also sufficient evidence that smoking cessation interventions are cost-effective. Moving to chapter six, um, chapter six and chapter seven are very meaty, robust chapters. Um, chapter six focused on interventions and treatments for nicotine dependence. It builds on research that was conducted um, since the 2008 U.S. Preventive Services Task Force Clinical Practice Guideline that um, I know all of us are familiar with. This chapter covers behavioral treatments, modes of delivering those behavioral treatments, pharmacological treatments, combinations of behavioral and pharmacological treatment, modified and alternative tobacco products, including, as um, Dr. Adams mentioned, very low nicotine content cigarettes and e-cigarettes. It also covers teachable moments in which cessation treatments might have particular or increased effects, and subpopulations like pregnant women, adolescents, dual tobacco product users, and light and non-daily uh, smokers for whom there might be some unique considerations when we think about cessation. So um, similar to the 2008 Preventive um, uh, Service Task Force Guidelines, Clinical Practice Guidelines, this report found sufficient evidence that behavioral counseling and cessation medications are effective alone in increasing smoking cessation and that they're more effective when used together. The report also found sufficient evidence to suggest that combining behavioral counseling and medication increases smoking cessation compared to self-help materials or to no treatment. So again, those are very similar conclusions to what we have from the 2008 uh, clinical practice guideline. Um, in terms of behavioral interventions, the report found sufficient evidence that proactive quitline interventions alone or in combination with medication can increase cessation. And proactive means that the quitline reaches out to the person as opposed to just relying on the person to be the one calling into the quitline. Um, the intervention is not you know, wholly dependent on the person. So I think that's a very important caveat. 
Um, in terms of how we deliver these behavioral interventions, um, the evidence was sufficient to infer that short text messages about quitting independently can increase smoking cessation and that those text messages are most effective when they are interactive or tailored to the individual responses. So this is a, a conclusion that, that really takes into account science that's happened since 2008, since that clinical practice guideline came out. Um, we also found sufficient evidence that web or internet-based interventions increase smoking cessation, especially when they're delivered um, using proven behavioral change techniques. So, for example, if they're delivered using techniques based on motivational interviewing or cognitive behavioral therapy, um, that, that that would make those web-based interventions um, more effective. The evidence was inadequate for smartphone applications at this time. In terms of medication treatments, the evidence is sufficient to infer that combining short and long-acting forms of nicotine replacement therapy can increase smoking cessation compared to using just one form of NRT. Again, this is an advance um, based on the science since 2008 and um, something that, that I, I think the senior editors as well as the Centers for Disease Control feel is important that um, we work to put more into practice. Um, so combining medications. Um, has value. The evidence was suggestive but not sufficient that preloading, which means you're starting a medicine in advance of a quit attempt, especially with the patch, can increase cessation. In terms of modified and alternative tobacco products, the evidence was suggestive but not sufficient that very low nicotine content cigarettes can reduce smoking and nicotine dependence and can increase cessation. Um, some of the challenge in the body of work that exists, and for those of you who were in the room for um, the speaker before us, I think she, she really highlighted the spectrum of work in an excellent way. Um, these studies have been conducted in a context in which full nicotine cigarettes are available. And so the effects might be greater in an environment in which conventional cigarettes and other combustible tobacco products are not readily available. Um, and there have been challenges, as was alluded to in the earlier presentation, in being able to figure out how to study that. With regard to e-cigarettes, um, I think the report clearly acknowledges that this is a heterogeneous class of products and includes a variety of products. You can, you can see from the picture, first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, um, and all of these are still you know, on the market. So there's a, a heterogeneous class of products. The evidence we reviewed in the report is inadequate to infer that e-cigarettes in general increase smoking cessation. The evidence was suggestive but not sufficient to infer that the use of e-cigarettes that contain nicotine is associated with increased smoking cessation compared to the use of e-cigarettes that do not contain nicotine. And the evidence was suggestive but not sufficient to infer that more frequent use of e-cigarettes was associated with increased smoking cessation compared to less frequent e-cigarette use. I think um, Surgeon General Adams did an excellent job highlighting the many areas of opportunity for ongoing research. Um, the e-cigarette conclusions in this report were similar to the conclusions from the 2018 National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine report. And the report acknowledges that these conclusions need to be considered as well in the broader context of youth use and um, e-cigarettes. So chapter seven um, broadens away from the individual interventions and focuses on the clinic, the health system as a whole, and population level strategies. And we use the CDC's three buckets framework to guide this chapter. This is a framework that focuses on um, how interventions work together between healthcare and public health. So bucket one. Um, is focused on traditional clinical prevention. So these would be your one-on-one -on -one interventions that occur in a clinical setting. Bucket two broadens those into interventions that may have clinical roots but may move beyond the walls of the clinic. So for example, tobacco quit lines um, would fit into this bucket as well as some of the um, coverage of healthcare services. And then finally, bucket three focuses on population level interventions. These are the big macro level policies um, that, that can happen in a large community or large geographic area. So in terms of bucket one, that classic clinical work, there is evidence, um, sufficient evidence to infer that developing and disseminating clinical practice guidelines can increase the delivery of clinical interventions for smoking cessation and that strategies that link smoking cessation uh, 
to quality measures, especially if they're quality measures that have payment attached, can also increase delivery of smoking cessation treatment. In terms of bucket two, those innovative interventions that can extend beyond the clinic walls, tobacco quit lines represent a population-based approach to motivate quit attempts and increase smoking cessation. And in terms of payment structures, provision and promotion of barrier-free evidence-based cessation insured coverage can increase the availability and utilization of smoking cessation treatment. In terms of bucket three, those big population-based strategies, um, a number of, of strategies were reviewed. In terms of sufficient evidence, um, the evidence was sufficient to infer that many of these policies, including increasing the price of cigarettes, implementing smoke-free policies, conducting mass media campaigns um, that include the quit line number as part of them, funding comprehensive tobacco control programs, and including large pictorial health warnings on uh, tobacco pack cigarette packages, that all of those can increase smoking cessation. The evidence was suggestive but not sufficient to determine that plain packaging alone increases smoking cessation um, and can decrease the availability of, um, of or, sorry, and then but decreasing the availability of tobacco products and exposure to point of sale tobacco marketing and advertising can increase cessation. And then finally, that restricting the sale of certain types of tobacco products like flavors, menthol, et cetera, can increase cessation, particularly among certain populations. So chapter eight, which is the last chapter in the report, um, focuses on the vision for the future. This is traditionally what the last chapter of Surgeon General's report focus on. It also provides some historical perspective um, in addition to, to looking ahead. So this figure I think is familiar to all of us. It shows the per capita annual cigarette consumption among adults um, as across major smoking health and policy events um, over more than a century now. So we can see that while there have been declines in adult smoking um, over a number of decades now, they have been in part due to policies and um, events that have decreased youth initiation. So we know that a continued focus on helping adults to quit remains critically important for further reducing the prevalence of cigarette smoking. And the 2014 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report um, reviewed a number of end game strategies and I'm sure they've been discussed at the conference this week. Um, that report reviewed their relevance to the United States. And I think importantly for the context of this report, those strategies, um, you know, while they aim to get us to the finish line, should not stand alone. Employment of any of those strategies, which you can read here, should be coupled with a focus on tobacco cessation and the delivery of the interventions and evidence-based approaches that have been detailed in this report. Um, so key takeaways from this report, um, as, as we wrap up this presentation, and I think Surgeon General Adams highlighted many of these, so I'll be brief. Um, 34 million adults in the U.S. still smoke and are still at risk for all of the smoking-related morbidity and mortality. One of the most important actions they can take is to quit smoking, and this is true regardless of their age or how long they've been smoking. Um, there are proven treatments and strategies to help people quit smoking. I think importantly, this report reviews some of the advances in those treatment areas since the 2008 clinical practice guideline. Um, and in addition, we need to ensure that people have access to these interventions, um, as well as we need to continue to explore novel strategies that can continue to help people quit. Um, so I think to end the toll of this tobacco use epidemic, the evidence-based strategies in this report must be fully implemented, sustained with sufficient intensity and duration. And if this doesn't happen, we know that half a million Americans will continue to die each year from smoking-related diseases and exposure to secondhand smoke. Millions of Americans will continue to live with serious smoking-related diseases, and it will cost our society hundreds of billions of dollars. So smoking cessation is definitely an important part of this equation. Um, I've shown here some of the resources that um, Surgeon General Adams mentioned as well that are available for all of you to get more information about the report. Um, and I think we, I went fairly fast, but I think we do have some time for questions. I'm not sure how that will be moderated in the room, but thanks for your time and attention. <laughs> Thank you, and a big round of applause. So we can take questions if anyone has questions on this session. You can 
can come to the mic. Please. Um, Deborah Arnott from Ash. Um, just to say, brilliant to have this presentation and great to have the Surgeon General here, really impressive. Um, I just wanted to pick up on e-cigarettes because the medicines regulator in the UK um, uh, basically came to the conclusion that there is very good evidence for nicotine replacement therapy uh, uh, to be effective in helping smokers quit and that on that basis, as long as e-cigarettes could be shown to deliver nicotine at least as effectively as NRT, um, that uh, efficacy is proven. So what they are looking for in applications for a medicines license isn't proof of efficacy, but proof of delivery and um, safety and reliability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in that context, I'd just really like to ask for comments and also for why there isn't more research going on. I mean, you know, there was a slide about all sorts of other things which are suggestive of maybe being helpful, like vaccines, which are going to be really expensive and take a long time to deliver. If in the US they believe there isn't sufficient evidence, where is the research going on to prove um, whether or not uh, e-cigarettes can be effective in quitting? Because actually, that's a really important um, conclusion to reach, given that um, this is something which, if we can accept that there is sufficient evidence, can be delivered quite quickly and um, easily, unlike many of the other interventions that are being looked at. Rachel, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, Deborah, for your question. Um, First, I want to say that I think one thing that's notable about this report is and the conclusions that were made in the analysis of the literature by the experts that provided it um, and our team is that, you know, it's really consistent with our National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine review. So in that way, it didn't really um, change that much. I understand um, that, you know, the project study was out um, post that report and uh, may be considered, of course, and was considered in the SGR. But I think looking at the totality of the evidence is important. It's, it's that the totality of the evidence here and that was reviewed, which included um, studies in other countries, as you know, where the RCTs have been able to be conducted, which is not the case here in the United States, um, really still found that there wasn't sufficient evidence to infer um, substantial benefit and that there's still inadequate evidence. I think that the issue is that there's still um, mixed findings and that all the evidence has to be taken into account from all the types of study designs, um, including longitudinal, observational, population-based study designs. So um, we also acknowledge that there are different contexts across different countries in terms of the policy environment as well as the use patterns. Um, in the United States, as you know, we have a really have experienced a huge increase in youth use to what has been termed by the Surgeon General himself epidemic proportions. So um, I think we need more research still and there's really, you know, a very important consideration to understand and balance the potential benefits to smokers with the potential risks that right now, at least in the US, are very real to youth using e-cigarettes and becoming addicted to nicotine. Um, as you alluded to, there are uh, policy issues in this country um, with investigators needing to obtain an IND to do smoking uh, to do trials where the endpoint is smoking cessation for their, you know, trials for therapeutic intent with these products, and that is not able to occur at this time. Um, but there is ongoing research funded in the United States regarding observing use patterns, including impacts on cessation, as well as switching studies. Um, so there is evidence that will inform this, but uh, we do acknowledge 
the point that you're bringing up. Great. Jillian, do you want to add any? Nope, that was very thorough. Okay, we have another question. Thank you. Hi, it's Masuma from University of York. Uh, first of all, nice presentation, lots of things we have learned. Uh, I just wondering, reconsidering the wider determinants of health, that perspective. We know smoking is highly associated with social deprivation, like poverty, unemployment, this type of wider determinants. So in cessation in any part of this uh, Surgeon General's recommendation, was that point addressed? Or any future guidance, how the studies could address that? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, this is Jillian. Um, thanks very much for that question, and I think that's an important point that there are a broader set of social determinants of health that may be impacted. Um, as the Surgeon General noted, this report was 700 pages just reviewing um, things that were very tangential to cessation, and I think we, um, as a senior editorial team, felt like there were a lot of um, opportunities to make improvements in those areas. So some of the chapters touch on some of the determinants that you um, mentioned in a, in a cursory way. For example, chapter three, which focuses on um, the epidemiology, you know, talks about some uh, indicators that fit into sort of that social determinants of health category, but there's not a chapter devoted to it, and it was not um, a huge focus of this report in large part because there's a lot of um, effort that we felt was needed uh, really just on some of the proximal variables. But I, I do think that that's um, important context and appreciate you raising that question. Rachel, do you have anything to add? No, thank you so much. Seeing no more audience questions, I want to thank you both, uh, Rachel and Jillian, for being present with us today and for your work on the report. This was a great session. Uh, and we'll move on to afternoon sessions. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.